today's lecture we're going to be discussing structs and how we can work with them in assembly. Going one step further than that, we're going to discuss how we can interface with C and C++ type structs through assembly as well. There is a subtle distinction between the two modes. Now, a struct is obviously a compound object and you've been introduced to structs in multiple programming languages up until this point. Now, obviously, a struct can do more than simply contain a bunch of member variables, like it can contain functions and so forth. But for our purposes and for the sake of this course, we will simply utilize a struct as a container for multiple variables that are stored contiguously to each other. Now, in the example here, we have a simple struct called customer. The customer struct has four member variables. It has an ID, a name, which is stored as a character array, an address, also a character array, and lastly, we have a balance. This could be, for example, how much the person owes the company that we're working with. Now, obviously, this is a very simple example. It's just to get us familiar with how we can work with structs in assembler. Now, the first thing I just want to clarify to avoid any confusion, in this context, the entire name array is actually part of the struct itself. This is not a situation where we simply have a pointer to an array being stored inside the struct. In this context, the entire array's content is part of the struct object. I think it's important to make that distinction clear. Specifically, if you'd go to a more complex setting where you may actually end up having pointers inside your structs that point to dynamically allocated memory. The way we discuss them is slightly different in terms of determining the size of the struct itself. Now, bringing or going further along that point is it's a very important thing to know how big a structure is, and specifically how big it is in terms of bytes. Now, there is an easy answer. Um, unfortunately, in a C and C++ context, you would be wrong if you take the easy route to calculating this. And there's a more complex answer, which I'll discuss towards the end of this lecture, which deals with things like alignment and why we might get a different answer in C and C++. But for the moment, let's assume we are in the easy mode of dealing with structs, and that is we are not planning on interfacing with C or C++ in any sort of fashion. So let's try and determine the size of our struct in that context. Now, an integer in 64-bit Linux is 4 bytes, and we have 2 in our structure, so that obviously adds 8 bytes to the total size of the object. We then have an array of characters, specifically we have two arrays, each containing 71 characters in each of them, which means those two arrays collectively add an extra 142 bytes to the size of our structure, which means in total our array will occupy, or sorry, our structure rather, will occupy 150 bytes of memory. Now if we want to try and work with a structure in assembler, this implies that we need to allocate 150 bytes of memory in order to try and work with a struct. Now obviously you could have a one-time struct where you assign everything on the data segment. However, for our purposes we want to be able to dynamically allocate a struct because we might be in a situation where we don't know how many unique versions of that struct we're going to be needing. So let's assume we want to try and allocate a struct. It's very straightforward. We make use of malloc again. Now we know that the size of our customer structure is 150 bytes. So we move 150 to RDI, which is the first parameter which we want to load for the malloc function. We then call malloc, and afterwards malloc is gonna return the address of the newly allocated memory. Specifically, it's gonna to return to us the address of the start of the struct. And in this example here, I'm simply saving that pointer into the variable that is in my data segment called C. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is how do we use the struct? Now, in assembler, there is not inherently structure imposed upon this data. At the moment, we just simply have 150 bytes, and we can do what we want with that 150 bytes. So it is the responsibility of ourselves to try and organize how we will actually divide these bytes and use them for our intentions. There'll be no checking if we do it incorrectly. It will simply fail to work as we expected. So one has to be very careful with this. The way we do this is we rely on offsets because... What is stored in C will point to the first location in this 150-byte chunk of memory. So say, for example, I want to work with an integer. I can say the first four bytes of that 150 is where I'll store the integer. Say I want to work with another integer after that. I will say the second chunk of four bytes in that 150 bytes I will use for the second integer. And we do that to allocate or to assign where all of these member variables should be stored inside the struct. In our example, we have 
an integer, which would obviously occupy the first four bytes. And then we have another 71 bytes, which will be occupied by the name string. Then another 71 bytes, which will be occupied by the address string. And finally, the last four bytes will be occupied by the balance integer. So with this in mind, we know that we need to work with some level of offsets. Now, I mentioned earlier that C, which in this case is still present in RAX, uh, will contain the address of the start of this contiguous chunk of memory. So if I want to, for example, load a new ID, I simply need to gain access or send my result to the first location from RAX. I'm simply dereferencing the address that RAX happens to hold in the situation. If I want to go to the start of my name array, I simply add the offset of four. If I want to go to the first location of my address character array, I simply add the offset of 75. Now that is obviously the offset of 71 plus four, which will give me the 75. Now, if I want to try and get to my balance variable inside my struct, I simply need to add an offset of 146. This will put me all the way right up to the last four bytes of my structure. Okay, now that we've allocated the space for our structure, let's try and utilize it in some context. Specifically, what we're going to do in this little code snippet is I'm going to simply load my structure with some predefined data, just to give you an example of how to utilize your structure. Now, before we get into the assembler code, I just want to recap a function or a C function, which we are going to be relying on. Specifically, we are going to utilize the string copy function. Now, the return value for our purposes is not necessary. The only thing that we are concerned with is the first and the second parameter. The first parameter is the address to which we want to copy a string to, the start address, that is. And the second parameter, the source, is obviously the string we wish to copy from to the destination okay now obviously there are certain requirements for example this character array that is corresponded to destination has to be of sufficiently large size and things of that nature but for this example don't worry too much about that now we first want to load our structure up with some information now you'll remember from the previous slide that rax currently contains the pointer to the first location of 150 bytes that we allocated. So if I want to set that first integer, I simply need to move, say the value of seven as an example, into the dereferenced RAX. So this will load the ID in my struct in essence. Just as a little bit of clarification, one should ask themselves why this D word keyword is present here. Now, a little bit of thought, if you remember some of your fundamentals, you'll know that if I didn't specify this D word, there is no way that the assembler could deduce the size that I want my destination to actually be. It could, for example, think, oh, I only need 8 bits, 16 bits, 64 bits. It has no way of determining. But if I specify D word, it knows immediately that I want to be storing a double data word or 32 bytes. And that is exactly how we defined it initially over here as an integer, which would be a double data word. Okay, now the second thing we wanna do is we wanna try and copy a couple of character arrays into our structure. Now, we have two of them defined in our data segment. Again, this is just for illustrative examples. We have our name string, and I wanna copy this into the corresponding name member variable of my structure. So what I do is I'm going to load the address of the actual name field into RDI. And I'm going to load the address of this name label over here into RSI. So this is the first and the second parameter for my string copy function. Then I'm going to call string copy and it will perform the copying for me. Now, what you see in the next line is important to note. You'll see that I now retrieve the pointer to my 150 bytes from my data segment and I push it back to RAX. Now, why do I need to retrieve the C value? The reason I need to retrieve the C value, or in this case, the pointer to my 150 bytes, is because on function calls, I have no guarantee that RAX will remain unchanged. I will often repeat this fact, but it's a very important thing to actually remember that we don't have any guarantees as to what will happen to our registers across function calls, unless they happen to be some of the registers that are call safe, 
which you will obviously find in your system ABI list. So we've made the string copy operation for our first um, member variable, specifically name, and we're going to do the same thing for our next member variable, which is address. Same procedure as before, the only difference now is that we have a different offset. Specifically, we have the offset of 75. Now, this conforms to what we discussed before in that this is simply 4 plus 71, so the size of the integer plus the size of the second member variable, and that's how we get to the offset of 75. Once I've completed this string copy mechanism, I then need to retrieve the initial pointer again from C, push it into RDX, and lastly, I need to extract the value that is in balance, which in this case is going to be 123, just for example, into EDX. The reason it is in moved into EDX is because in this case, we're working with an integer or a double data word. And then we will move it from EDX into the actual location inside our structure. Again, to get to this 146 value, we simply add 4 plus 71 plus 71, and then we get the corresponding offset. Now, Something that you will probably already be thinking is that it is quite a nuisance to have to remember all of these offsets. Specifically, if I decide at some later point I want to change my structure slightly or add another member variable, specifically if I want it to be the first or the second member variable, all of the subsequent offsets are now not going to be correct. And that means there's a lot of code I'm going to need to change. It's obviously not an ideal situation to be in. Luckily for us, there is some nice built-in tools available to us in Assembler that can simplify this process slightly. Now, there is a nice pseudo op defined in Yasm that is we can utilize to help build structs. And that is the struct pseudo op. Now, note that it is struct minus the T. It's not a typo, it is actually does, or written to not have the T at the end. So in this case, we will define a struct by simply typing struct followed by the name. In this case, we're going to call it customer. And we end the definition with nstruct. And inside, we actually define what all of the member variables will be. Specifically, id will be a double data word, and it will be specifically one double data word. Name will be 71 bytes. Address will also be 71 bytes. And balance will simply be one data word. Now, the important thing to note with this little definition is that one might be confused into thinking that this is reserving space for one struct entity. That is not the case. This is simply and should be interpreted as, as a definition of the structure. And the way we utilize this is if I make use of this name label, what I'll actually end up getting back is what the offset should be to get to name. So in this case, name will actually have the address value of four. So this is a very clever way of merging the notion of the equates that we used before and catering for the distance we are from the start of the structure. Extending that principle, if I were, for example, to take the value of address, address would in this case have the value of 4 plus 71, which means the value of address would be 75. So utilizing this general approach, it means that we don't have to worry about remembering the offset values themselves. And if something does happen to change in our code, we don't have to recalculate the offsets. Now, there's an extra little bit of utility available to us, and that is the size operation that the YASM provides when we utilize the pseudo op. Specifically, if I type the name of the struct, so consumer, followed by an underscore and the word size, this will contain the size of the structure or the size that the structure should hold. So in this case, it will simply add 4 bytes plus 4 bytes plus 142 bytes and it will give us the size of 150 that we calculated before. Now there's one obvious downside with this approach and it might not be obvious immediately but if we were to try and have another structure in our code we would for example have a product structure. It's possible that we might have another name field in that structure. However, now if I try and utilize the label name, the assembler is not going to know which name you were referring to. So we'd like to have some kind of mechanism to uniquely identify the customer name or the product name, for example. Now, there are two ways people generally go about solving this. 
The first is to prefix the names of the member variables with a dot, as you can see in this first little code segment over here. And if we do this, and I want to gain access to, for example, the offset corresponding to ID, I'll simply type consumer.id. The alternative to utilizing this prefix notation is to append some kind of character to the ID it's, or the member variable name itself to be able to uniquely distinguish it. For example, here I can simply add C underscore ID to indicate that this is the customer's ID. Now, both approaches seem to be used in practice. However, the first one is, in my opinion, quite preferable over the latter. And that is because if, for example, at some point I have a different structure, for example, cat, and cat happens to also have a name member variable, which one gets C underscore name and which one gets an alternative one? So does one end up being CA underscore name? So in, in that sense, we end up just extending the problem one step further. I'd rather have a general solution that can scale well, and the prefix notation gives us that. Through the examples you'll see, we'll utilize both of them. However, if you're writing large amounts of code, I highly recommend you utilize the prefix notation. Now, just to reinforce the idea that we have just learned, let's try and utilize this new way of writing out the struct in the context of assembler directly. So let's assume we have some example data present in our data segment for simplicity. We have name, address, and balance predefined, and we want to fill our struct with this information. Now we've defined our struct of our customer as follows, where we're utilizing the prefix notation as opposed to the dot prefix notation. So we're using the abbreviated prefix notation. Now, if I want to try and load anything into the structure, I can do it the old way without relying on pre pre-calculated offsets, or I can rely on my nice new pseudo op available that I've written over here. So first thing I do is I want to allocate space for my customer. So I will move customer underscore size into RDI. Now, customer size is not calculated during runtime. This is something that is inserted for us at the assembler time. So this doesn't cost us anything to do. And this will load the size of the customer struct into RDI. We can then call malloc and malloc will allocate sufficient space for our object. Now, RAX is again going to store the pointer. And now we want to try and copy our example strings name and address into our object. So for that reason, I'm going to make a safe copy of my point to my, uh, in this case, again, 150 bytes of memory, and I'll save that in C. Then if I want to, for example, set the ID of my customer, I do the same thing I did previously, except instead of having an explicit offset, in the previous case, this offset was zero. I will now use C underscore ID, and this will insert what the corresponding offset, offset in fact is. This means I don't have to worry about remembering it. Then I can complete my string copy operation, and I can move to copying the second string. Again, here, instead of typing an explicit offset, I can now rely on actually the pseudo opt in this calculation for me, and that C underscore address is going to insert the corresponding offset that I should have actually manually perhaps typed here. So this gives me that nice freedom again. I don't have to memorize it. So obviously in general, you'll rather use these pseudo ops if you're writing code, particularly if it's of any substantial length. And extending this further, the same thing can be used for actually storing the balance variable that we had in our data segment. Again, instead of using an explicit num number based offset, we can utilize the label to actually imply what the offset should be for us. Again, this doesn't cost any computation time. It makes the actual execution will be identical to if we had simply actually put the offset as, for example, 145 or something of that kind. It will not cost us anything at runtime. It only costs a small amount at assemble time, and it's really incredibly negligible. Now comes the time to answer an important question, and that is how big would our structure actually be in C and C++. Now remember, our structure had two integers, so four bytes each, and it had two arrays, each of size 71. Now if we add up all of those bytes, we ended up with 150 bytes total size. However, if we take the size of operation on our struct that we defined earlier, we end up getting a slightly different answer. Specifically, we end up getting 152 bytes. Now, there is nothing that can immediately tell us where this extra two bytes came from. By that, I mean the structure itself 
in isolation doesn't really hint at this fact. However, if we are informed with a little bit of extra knowledge, we can deduce why C++ and C are actually creating structs that are slightly larger in this case. Now, what happens in C and C++ is that they actually enforce primitives to have specific alignments based on their sizes. Now, this is for various optimization reasons that this is done. However, whenever you interface with C and C++, you need to ensure that you pr uh, conform to the same alignment specifications that they do. This allows you to obviously effectively move structs from C++ to assembler and back again. And the what C and C++ do to actually enforce this alignment is they effectively pad the structure where necessary to make this alignment possible. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Now, in 64-bit Linux, obviously this is different in 32-bit Linux and also different in Windows, again. Again, assembler is the poster child of non-portability, so that shouldn't be a surprise. But in 64-bit Linux, characters don't have any alignment requirements. That's not surprising in a sense because they all occupy one byte, so that in some sense they trivially conform to alignment of falling onto a boundary that is a multiple of one, which obviously they do. Then we have shorts, which are of size two bytes, and they must start on an even address, or the address must be a multiple of two. Obviously, that is the same thing, just said differently. Now, ints and floats are four bytes, so they must start on a multiple of four, and by now I assume you'll be able to deduce on what multiple longs and doubles should lie. Seen as no logs and doubles are eight bytes, they should lie on multiples of eight. Now, pointers should also lie on multiples of eight, and that is because in 64-bit Linux, pointers occupy eight bytes themselves as well. In C and C++, there's also one further concept of alignment that we need to try and ensure, and that is that the elements inside the struct or the member variables inside the structs must have their alignments maintained even if I were to pack multiple struct objects next to each other in, for example, a contiguous array. So this means that, for example, if I have an integer at the end of my structure, I need to ensure that I need to pad sufficient alignment after it such that the first member of the subsequent struct does not lie on a different multiple than it should have originally. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, once you've seen a few of these be worked out, it actually becomes very natural to figure out what the alignment should be. Let's consider the very simple struct example here where we have a pointer. Now remember, a pointer is 8 bytes. We have a single character, which is one byte, and then we have an integer. Now, the first thing one needs to answer is, how big will the struct actually be in C++? In C++, or in C, the struct will be of size 16 bytes. The reason it will be size 16 bytes is that you will note that the alignment, let's assume, for simplicity at the moment, that we start on zero when we discuss these structs. We generally start on a boundary of 16, but let's simply assume that we start on 0. You'll note that obviously if we start in at 0, 0 is a multiple of 8 in a trivial sense, so that works fine. And the next one, when we have to specify the char, well, chars have no alignment specifications, so that's not a problem. However, if we add 8 and 1, we now have 8 bytes stacked next to each other, sorry, 9 bytes stacked next to each other, and 9 is not a multiple of 4. So we need to add sufficient padding between this char and the int to ensure that 4 lies on a multiple of 4 boundary. So I need to pad 3 bytes between the char and the integer to ensure that the location this integer is actually stored on is a multiple of 4. Now obviously if we simply pad it, as you can see in this example, everything works out fine. 4 will always be a multiple. Sorry the location of this x will always end up being a multiple of 4 and our alignment criteria has been satisfied. If we consider another example where we have a character which is of again just one byte and then a pointer. The place where padding will be inserted is going to be a little different in that for the start of the structure we don't have any concerns because that automatically lies on a multiple of one boundary. However, we can see that clearly, once I've added 1 to 0, 1 is not a multiple of 8. And in order to get to the lowest next multiple of 8, I'd need to pad by 7 bytes. 
So in this case, we would end up having a structure that is also 16 bytes. Now this is something that can surprise people because this is quite a substantial jump in size. We've nearly doubled the size of this example struct in order to cater for this padding. Now what's interesting is that in some extreme cases it becomes optimal to order your items in your structure such that it requires a minimum amount of padding. But that's not something we have to concern ourselves too much with in this course but it's something interesting to note as a, a kind of optimization or just kind of space optimization which is sometimes done. Now Obviously, we need to make sure that our struct objects can preserve their alignment properties even if we were to stack multiple of them contiguously. Again, that's part of the C++ requirement that we're trying to conform to and that C++ obviously does itself. Now, if we have this example here, we have an integer, which is four bytes again, and a character, which is one byte. Now, the size of this might not be quite what you were anticipating, because everything looks fine at first glance. Well, if we started at zero, zero is a multiple of four in the trivial context, and obviously the character itself doesn't have any alignment requirements. But if I was to stack another example structure directly after this example structure, you will see that the first member variable will end up being at location five, because we ended up having four plus one, and then the next structure starts, and then this E would be at location five. Now, 5 is not a multiple of 4. So the way we have to get around this is we have to add a padding at the end of this character. So we need to actually pad by 3 bytes at the end of this example to make sure that when we stack multiple example structs next to each other, that the alignment is still held for each of the member variables. And that's why in this case you'll see that this is what C and C++ will automatically do for us. Now, Let's consider another example which is quite similar is let's say we have our example here where we have a long which is 8 bytes and we have a character which is 1 byte. Now same procedure as before we will now need to pad in accordance to what the size of the first member variable happened to be. This is to ensure that again if we stack multiple examples next to each other or example structures next to each other that the alignment of the member variables is still maintained. Specifically that E always lies on a multiple of 8. Now the next example is a little bit more complex and that is a situation where the padding that we in essence need to apply does not directly correspond to the first member variable. Now what this will end up happening what will end up happening to this if we work in C and C++ is there are two places where padding will occur. The first is between A and B and that's because again let's assume we start at zero we then add four bytes which works fine but then we need to add we now need to be at location four but we want to load a long. Now obviously four is not a multiple of eight so we need to pad by four bytes so that's how we get this little padding over here. We then can place our long, we can place the character and then we need to try and place the padding that is necessary to ensure that we can stack multiple example structures next to each other. Now your gut instinct would be to say well that first one is 4 so that means I need to pad 3 bytes to ensure that it's still a multiple of 4. The problem with that approach is that works fine for the alignment of A in the subsequent structure. However, the next variable B will actually not be aligned anymore. I, I think it's a good example to go home and see why when I add only three bytes that this B will end up being at the wrong location if I start stacking structs next to each other. So for that reason we need to actually add a second pad of seven as opposed to three. And you'll see that this actually means that we end up padding at the end of the structure corresponding to the largest size subsequent element when we stack them contiguously. I think the best way to try and work through these examples at home is to construct some kind of struct object, try and calculate how big you think it will be, and then run a little bit of C code using the size of operation and see what the compiler actually generates. After doing that a few times, you'll start learning all of these patterns and how to actually easily deduce how big the structure should in fact be and where the alignment should take place. Now, once we have come to terms with all of this padding that is necessary, the next thing is how do we write this padding in a nice way in our assembler code. 
Luckily for us, Assembler provides a nice little operation. Specifically, it provides the align pseudo op, which can perform this kind of padding for us. So let's try and work through a, a little bit more of a complex example. In this example, you'll see that we're using very similar member variables to our previous examples. Things have just changed a little bit to, to just keep things a little fresh. We see here that we have an ID and name address a balance and we have an extra local variable called rank okay now rank in this case is simply going to be a single byte and all of the previous member variables are going to be the same type that they were before the only difference is that we have a little bit less space for our character arrays now now if we were to work through this you will see that there are two places that we would need to actually add padding and that would be after the second character array before we specify our first double data word. Now we know that this double data word actually needs to be uh, on a multiple of four. We calculate specifically how many bytes we, we have present. We can see how much we would need to actually add. What this align does for us is that it doesn't require us to explicitly calculate what the align or the amount of pad would have to be. We simply specify that we make sure that balance will fall on a multiple of four or the address of balance will fall on a multiple of four. And the compiler itself, or the assembler itself, will add the corresponding amount of pad that we need. So luckily we don't have to go through that calculation ourselves every time. Then lastly here, we will again add another align. And this is so that when we hook back around to the top of the object, when we this is for when we're stacking multiple consecutively, we will actually add the corresponding pad to ensure that this first double data word is also on a multiple of four. Since we know how to work with structs, let's try and go through a slightly bigger example. Let's try and construct an array of 100 structures and then try and do something sequentially through this entire array. So first I'm going to move 100 into RDI because I want to construct 100 of these arrays. So now I need to malloc 100 times the size of the customer and then I can actually have that much dynamically allocated memory. So 100 times what customer size is, this will again calculate the size of the customer for us, catering for all the padding that is induced by the align command, which is nice, we don't have to worry about it. And then we call malloc. Malloc is going to return our pointer to the start of this array, and we can move that pointer into our customer's variable that we have in our data segment. The reason I'm moving this into a data segment variable is I'm going to be calling some C functions shortly and I want to make sure it's preserved somewhere. Could obviously use the stack if you wanted, however this for the moment is sufficient. Now in this example we simply have a little format string because we want to output all of the information inside our structure to the screen and we have a little function here and what this function will do is it will simply print out the entire array. This is a very simple function, it doesn't take any parameters, we're just working directly from the data segment. But the point here is to illustrate how we can gain access to specific structs that are inside an array. So the first thing I'm going to do, because this is a function that has the intention of calling other functions, is I'm going to set up my stack frame and destroy it with this leave command. And I've made the decision that instead of using some stack based storage, I want to use two registers that I know are safe across function calls. So for this example, I'm going to push R15 and R14 onto the stack. And before I leave, I'm going to pop R14 off and then pop R15 off. So this is so I can restore what their old values happen to be. Now, don't get confused and think because I'm working with structures, now I have to automatically use these callee safe uh, registers. That's not the case. I'm just using another example of how we can try and deal with the fact that things are lost across function calls. If you feel more comfortable, feel free to rather use the stack memory instead of using the callee save functions or the callee save registers. So in this case, we've saved the old value of those two registers, which we'll reset before we return. So that's set up for us. I'm going to move 100 into R15 because I have 100 customer structs. I wish to print out the data to the screen. Now, obviously, we will assume before this function is called that somehow that information was filled. So I move 100 into R15, and then I'm going to move the dereferenced customer into R14. So what this is going to do is it's going to actually pass the pointer of the first element of that array into R14. 
Now that it is in R14, I can use offsets from R14 to gain access to the member variables of that specific structure. So I'm going to load the format, which is defined up there into RDI, and then I'm going to load the following two addresses. Now this is where you might get slightly lost if you're not paying attention is you'll note that I'm gaining access to R14 plus the offset but remember what I want to pass through to the printf is the address. So that is why I'm loading via LEA. So do that for the name and for the address. Okay because remember I need to pass through the address if I'm trying to printf as opposed to simply the actual character value. Then lastly I want to try and extract the balance and then I'm going to simply move it from inside the current structure object I'm dealing with into ECX. Remember ECX we're using again because it happens to be a double data word. And then I'm going to call printf. Printf will output to the screen and now we can repeat this process. But here's where things get interesting. You'll see that I'll take R14 and I'll add to it the customer size. This means from the original customer array instead of incrementing by I or 64 or 8 or something like that, I will actually move by the number of bytes that that actual structure object would represent. So one structure, in our case, will represent a certain number of bytes. So I'm moving from the first one to the second one. So in essence, I'm moving up in the array of customers. That's what that line is doing. Then I'm going to decrement R15 because I know there's one less customer I need to try and output. Then I'm going to check, well, is that after this decrement, do I end up getting something that is not zero? So if I don't have something that's not zero, it means I'm still decreasing from 100 and I haven't got to zero yet. In that case, I'll jump back up to more and I'll repeat this process again and again until finally this jump doesn't happen. I'll then restore my values that I saved onto the stack initially with my two pop commands and then I'll destroy the stack frame and return. So the important thing to take away from this example is how I'm gaining access to different elements in the array when each element happens to be a structure as its whole. So it's a very subtle thing, but it's worth paying close attention to how I'm actually extracting the first element and from that how I am shifting into the next element. So this R14 will contain the address of the first element. When I add customer size to it, it will contain the address of the second element and so on and so forth. One small thing I just feel like I need to mention in this example snippet is that I realize now that at no point do we set RAX to be zero to indicate that we have no floating point parameters for the printf. That is something that is not in the textbook either that one should actually add to ensure that this code operates as you're not really sure what RAX would be before this executes. And that brings us to the end of today's lecture.